In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Very limited time on just a weekend retreat, and the exercises are so rich. But I, I don't believe in cramming conference after conference and just bombarding everyone where you just go through the whole day, every other half hour, just going through a conference. I'd rather give like uh, four conferences today and hopefully they'll sink in and give you more time to reflect upon each conference because if you're not going to uh, interiorize it, if you're not going to take it and contemplate on what you learn, if you're just going to take notes the whole weekend and, and then people say, well, I'll go home and I'll go through the notes, it usually never happens. So I'll give, a little, I'll, I'll give four conferences today. And I, I did spread them out, as you can see on the schedule, so hopefully you're going to use that time to reflect on what you heard in the particular conference. And uh, right now, the weather's not the best, so maybe that's our Lord's way of telling you He wants you in the chapel more, or in your room. But it is a beautiful place, too. To, if it is nice, you could walk. You could go up the hill here. There's a cemetery if you go down the Stations of the Cross. So you can enjoy that too. So I'm going to try to almost cram two of them in right now. I just want to touch upon the, the, the evil of mortal sin. Because yesterday we talked about how we're born, we're created to save our souls, to know God, to love Him, to serve Him, in order to be happy with Him for eternity. The only thing that can separate us from God is sin, nothing else. Nothing else. And so when we sin, we choose to sin. Okay? And so I'm just going to, I want to go all over the effects of mortal sin. And then I'm going to spend most of the conference on what I think is one of the biggest problems today. And always has been, I believe, in today. And especially even in the church. And I'm going to focus on the sin of human respect. It's a horrible, horrible sin that leads to millions of sins in the church too it's horrible so I just want to go quick on Drew, some of the effects of mortal sin so a Christian is a child of God and a member of Christ's mystical body he is raised to a higher level of life to the very life of God his actions spring from a supernatural principle of life from grace all of them, even the most ordinary, are divine actions, most of all an eternal reward. Nothing can deprive him of such high dignity. For I am confident that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's St. Paul from Romans chapter 8 verse 38 so nothing can separate us from the love of God only ourselves nothing indeed except mortal sin man must attain salvation through submission and obedience but with the rebel angels and his disobedience first parents he too claims freedom and independence Freedom and independence. Freedom and independence of thought, of love, of actions, of enjoyment. We separate that from God. Though but a creature, a son, a soldier, and a subject, he cries, non servion, I will not serve to his creator, his father, his commander, and his king. Mortal sin, then, is a turning unduly to some mutable good and a consequent turning away from God, the immutable good. The sinner disobeys God, not because he loves him not, but because he loves him less than a creature, less than himself. And that's the problem, that we don't love God enough, that we put other things before him. Look at the evil people in the world. If we had the zeal that they have for their master, which is Satan, the world would be changed, it would be converted. But we don't love God enough. Look at what goes on in this disgraceful country. 
how the uh, minority homosexual lesbians, these wicked people, change in laws. The very they they'll die for their cause. They'll die for Satan. What are you willing to do for your master? So you put creatures above God. You place between God and a creature forbidden by God. He would not like to be forced to choose. But he does choose and he chooses to please himself. His conscience may yield with a pang of heart, but it yields. Every creature is but a means to serve God and to go to him. The sinner turns it into an idol and shamefully loathes himself in front of it. Examine your conscience. Do you have any idols in your life? What is taking you away from God? Mortal sin destroys all good things in man. It destroys the supernatural life. By charity a man is united to God, his last end, and the principle of moral order. Sin is the rejection of this order. Sin deprives the sinner of all supernatural merits he may have gained. The only way you merit is when you're in the state of sanctifying grace. Everything you do in grace, you get merit in heaven. It's storing up treasure. Store your treasure in heaven, our Lord says. And if you commit mortal sin, it's so evil that if you accumulated 50 years of merit and you commit one mortal sin, all the merits for 50 years are gone. It's the horror of sin. We don't reflect upon the sins of the angels. Saint, Saint Ignatius, I can't go through, but he goes through the three sins, the sins of the angels. The angels only had one chance. They had to merit heaven. They had to be put to the test. And they were uh, superior beings than us. They have infused knowledge. They had many great gifts. And so they just denied God. They would not serve Him, and that was it. That sin was so horrible, they were cast into the pit of hell instantly. One sin. How many mortal sins have you committed? If you committed one mortal sin, you're as bad as an angel. If you committed ten mortal sins, you could say you commit as bad as ten angels. But you committed thousands. And all those angels that have fallen are in hell burning. They can never get out of hell again. They're in there forever in the abyss of hell. That's the horror of sin. We have to reflect upon that. The sins then of our first parents, Adam and Eve. God didn't intend man to die. Not at all. We had, they had preternatural gifts, gifts above and beyond their nature. One of the gifts was immortality. God, is, He didn't create human beings to die. But because of sin, death comes into the world. And human beings must die. Every human being will die because of the sin of our first parents. And because of that sin, they lost all their preternatural gifts, integrity, immortality, infused knowledge, and so on. They lost it all. And they were cast out of the garden. And they, had a, they lived 900 years, Adam and Eve. And that's a fact. 900 years they suffered for their sin. That's how bad original sin was. And we all come into the world with original sin and the consequences are devastating. And even when we're baptized, our original sin is cleansed. Original sin is not, people think of it as like this stain, this black spot. No, original sin is something that should be there that's not be there. What should be there? Sanctifying grace. It's not there. That's the price of sin. And so when a soul sins and you commit a mortal sin, you lose all your merits. But don't despair because when you confess your sins and you are forgiven, God is so awesome, He restores all those merits back. He doesn't have to do that. He could condemn you to hell. He could have condemned our parents, Adam and Eve, to hell for one sin. But He didn't. In Genesis 3.15 he gave them the first prophecy. 
that will put enmity between thee and the woman, and her seed and your seed. You shall strike out her heel, and she shall crush your head. The woman is the blessed virgin, so it gives us hope. And so, but this is the horror of sin. We don't realize the horror of sin. And that's why so many people keep on committing so many sins, because they don't reflect how evil it is. Reflect in your own life when you commit a mortal, when you have committed a mortal sin. It brings torture. It brings chaos into your life. It darkens your intellect. It weakens your will. It brings shame. It brings guilt. It's horrible. And when you commit a mortal sin, it affects not only you, but everyone around you. When men fall into the wicked sins today, pornography. I can't tell you how many kids come and confess that they went on the computer and all of a sudden this stuff pops up because daddy was on the computer. And when you go on a pornography site, what happens, you get all these pop-ups after that because once you log on one of them, so many of these poor kids, seven years old, they're hooked on pornography now because their father was watching it and this pops up. Horrible. And you destroy your son's soul. Your daughter's soul. I've seen so many marriages wrecked and destroyed because of pornography. It's horrible. It's horrible. Sin gives a certain inclination to what is evil even as human acts produce an inclination to like acts. Through it, reason is obscured, especially in practical matters. The will is hardened to evil. Good actions become more difficult. And concupiscence, you're more prone to. It's harder to fight it off. Sin incurs a debt of eternal punishment. If a sin destroys the principle of the order whereby man's will is subject to God... The disorder will will be such as to be considered in itself irreparable, although it is possible to repair it by the power of God. Now the principle of this order is the last end to which man adheres by charity. Therefore, whatever sin turns man away from God, so as to destroy charity, considered in themselves, they incur debt of eternal punishment. Sin comprises two things. First, there is a turning away from the immutable good, which is infinite. Wherefore, in this respect, sin is infinite. When you commit a mortal sin, it's an infinite offense against God. Secondly, there is an inordinate turning to immutable good. In this respect, sin is finite, both because the mutable good itself is finite, and because the movement of turning towards it is finite, since the act of a creature cannot be infinite. Accordingly, insofar as sins consist in turning away from God, its corresponding punishment in the, is the pain of loss, which also is infinite, because it is the loss of the infinite good, God. But insofar as sin turns inordinately to the mutable good, its corresponding punishment is the pain of sense, which is also infinite, which is also finite. We can then understand how truly Christ would say when alluding to Judas, Judas, one of you is a devil, and when talking to a sinner in general, he shall be cast forth as a branch, and shall wither, and they shall gather him up, and cast him into the fire, and he burn it. It is in hell, my friends, that one truly will learn what sin is in hell. Also, if you save your soul and you have to go to purgatory, you'll realize how horrible sin is and the price of sin. And so we have to have a deep hatred for this mortal sin that can separate us from God. So many souls play fast and loose with their soul. I can't tell you how many men and women commit mortal sin. And they'll wait weeks, months, 
What you wait so long for? God guarantees you He'll forgive you if you come to confessional, confess your sins with true sorrow and you're absolved. But He never guarantees anyone that they're going to get to the confessional. There's no guarantee that, my friends. And it says in the Bible, as fish are taken with hooks, so sinners are taken in their sins. Don't play fast and loose with your soul. When you commit a mortal sin, you better run to the confessional. Beg God right away. Try to make a perfect act of contrition. You have to pay, pray to the Blessed Virgin for the grace to hate sin. Have a deep hatred that your attitude will be like uh, St. Dominic Savion. Death rather than sin. Cut my head off before I commit even the slightest venial sin. That just drives me nuts with this nonsense with these elections where you're being lied to and told to vote for the lesser of the two evils. That's bull. It's nonsense. We must have nothing to do with evil. Never choose evil. Never. Sin is the killing of love. How beautiful, how happy, and how glorious the Son of God made man to be by right. But he took upon himself to atone for the sins of mankind and see what sin has done with him. Not only is mortal sin the destroyer of man's supernatural life, but its nature is but its nature it aims at destroying God Himself. That's what sin does. It aims at destroying God. The moment God appeared in a human and passable form, sin actually killed him physically. See our Lord crucified. Behold his head crowned with thorns. His face sped upon, his eyes dimmed, his eye, his arms disjointed, his tongue embittered with gall and vinegar, his hands and his feet pierced with nails, his back and shoulders torn with lashes, his soul sad unto death, his heart immersed in an ocean of desolation. See him in the garden of Gethsemane sweating blood. Because he's seen all our sins, the sins of all mankind. Imagine the weight that our Lord carried in the garden. Our Lord's passion, my friends, didn't just begin when he entered into in the garden and get sent. It began the moment he was conceived in his mother's womb. When he was an embryo, when he was a baby, in his mother's womb, he had the gift of reason, of course. He had the beatific vision. And he saw all the sins of mankind and he suffered in his human nature from the moment he entered the world. The moment he entered the world. It's the price of our sins. This is what we do to our Lord. And that's why I recommend with the saints, tell you, meditate on the passion every day. If you want to grow in wisdom and knowledge and grace, do the stations of the cross and you will realize the horror of sin. Why is Christ hanging on the cross for our sins? To avert from us the anger of His Father and to free us from the punishment due to our sins. Christ had to come and die for us because no man could merit in an infinite way. And the sin was infinite. And so Christ becomes the God-man. He becomes a human like us in all things except sin. But he's not a human person. He's a divine person. And therefore all his acts are infinite. And that's why we are able to be saved. And what have we done to this infinite lover who has died for us? Who has suffered for us? We have repeatedly pierced his heart with ever new swords. We have pierced it with the sword of indifference. We profess to believe in Christ's love and yet that love has had no place in our heart. We have been in constant pursuit of other loves. We have pierced Jesus' hearts with the sword of ingratitude. O oh, my people, what have I done to thee? Or in what have I afflicted thee? Answer me. 
What more would I have done for thee, and have not done it? I planted thee indeed, my most beloved, in my most beloved vineyard, and thou art become to me exceedingly bitter. For thou hast given me vinegar in my thirst, and with a spear thou hast pierced the side of thy Savior. I went before thee in a pillar of a cloud, and thou hast brought me to the place of Pilate. I have gave thee a royal scepter, and thou hast given me a crown of thorns. I have exalted thee with great strength, and thou hast hanged me on the gibbet of the cross. These words are for each one of us from our Lord himself. It should make us weep what we have done. Because each of us have crucified him. Each of us has pierced the heart of his mother. Which made him weep on the cross. We have pierced the heart. The divine heart with the sword of contempt. Urged to choose between Christ and Barabbas. The satisfaction of our passions. To choose creatures over God. To choose sin. And when we do that we cry out. With the Jews, not this, but Barabbas. Crucify him. Every time you commit a mortal sin, you cry out, crucify him. You spit on our Lord. You crown him with thorns. You nail him to the cross by choosing to look at pornography, by choosing to get drunk, by choosing to commit all kinds of wicked sins. Human respect, which we're going to talk about. We are plunged in the heart of our Creator and Lord, the sword of treason. Repeatedly we swore fidelity to Christ, and yet with Judas we have gone to his enemies, to Satan, the world and our passion, and asked of them, What will you give me? What pleasure and what satisfaction are you going to give me? And I will deliver Christ into your hands to be again tortured and crucified. And yet he is still our loving father. He still opens his arms and his very heart to us. What then can we do but plunge ourselves into that abyss of love and mercy to be there purified and to live henceforth only by its life. And that's what's so awesome about our God. He doesn't wish the sinner to perish. He wants the sinner to repent. He wants the sinner to come and cleanse his sin. And today, how many people weep for the sins against Christ? Even his own church is crucifying him. Church is in shambles. Church is filled with sin. Just like our Lord's time. Who crucified Christ? The Jews, the Pharisees, the scribes. The great scholars, the ones that knew the scripture inside out. Who's crucifying them more than anyone? The church. The church. It's horrible. I want to speak on this horrible sin of human respect. Pay attention, because everyone is guilty of it. And this is where we choose creatures over God. Our blessed Lord, during his mortal life, verified the prophecy of the holy old man Simeon. For ever since there has been war between him and the world, in the way of thinking and of judging, of law and the rule of conduct, no man has yet succeeded in pleasing both, nor will this ever, ever be possible, as our Lord himself has once for all asserted. You can't serve God and mammon. You choose Christ or you choose the devil. There is no middle road, my friends. There's St. Ignatius throughout the exercise. He has the two kingdoms. Kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. You're in one or the other. In the spiritual life, there's, there's no such thing as remaining stagnant, as remaining still. You're either moving closer and closer to Christ or you're moving towards Satan. There is no either way. One or the other. Where are you, my friends? 
Are you serving Christ? Which kingdom are you in? And are you willing to lay your life down for the kingdom? The Satanists are. People that follow Him are willing to die for Him. Once again. If then we would please God, we must make up our minds to trample upon human respect and disregard the opinions of men. I'll repeat that. Disregard the opinions of men. We must reject all fear of what the world will say whenever there is a question of performing our duty. Question yourself. Are you doing that? Do you have, do you, when you hear, do you give in to human respect with people at work, with your family? Because you don't want to look like a fool. You don't want to be embarrassed or you want to be cool. To this end, let us consider how much human respect dishonors and degrades a man and is injurious to his soul. How grievously it outrages the majesty of God and by what means it is to be overcome. Human respect manifests itself in an inordinate desire of pleasing men or dread of displeasing them, which impels us either to omit the good we ought to do or commit ourselves to the evil which we should avoid. I'm going to repeat that. So, it's an inordinate desire of pleasing men or dread of displeasing men, which impels us either to omit the good we ought to do or commit ourselves to the evil which we should avoid. But it is our moral liberty and independence are sacrificed, and we follow in the footsteps of those persons or principles which we are bound to despise, or of a certain vague and undefined public which would beyond a doubt ultimately respect us if we acted with firmness and constancy, in which only pities and despises us when it sees us wavering before and submitting ourselves to its tyranny. So these people in the world that you give in to human respect, they're like vultures. They'll tempt you and they'll, they'll mock you until you conform. But once you conform to, they have no use for you because you're weak. They despise you. They laugh at you. Say, look at this idiot. He did what I told him to do. They love it. They love it. And I see it. It's constantly all around us. I can't tell you. This sin is so, so prominent today. In the church, too. How many people are afraid to speak up and defend Christ in His church by word and by deed? You're obliged to. We are the church militant. When you become confirmed, you are a soldier of Christ. And you must defend Christ by word and by deed. And that's why confirmation, a bishop would slap you in the face. I tell people today all the time, they, they better start cracking them over the head with a two by four. They got to wake us up. Because it's in your intellect that you deny God. And by the bishop slapping you in the face, it's a sign that you are willing to endure all punishment, all torture, even death itself, then betray Christ. My friends, we're coming to a time in history unheard of in this country. We haven't been under the reign of communism until now. And it's going to really happen. And when it happens, it's going to happen fast. Every one of you men here are going to be put to the test. Every one of you. And you're going to have an opportunity to deny Christ. Or to affirm Him and His church and lay down your life. You've got to start praying that you'll never give in to human respect. I recommend you read the book, St. Alphonse. It's called The Victories of the Martyrs. And in that beautiful book, in the first half, he gives the history of the early Roman martyrs in the Catholic Church. And the second half is almost even better, the Japanese martyrs. One... one one particular story, I just never forgot it. When a Japanese man, he, was, he wouldn't deny Christ. And so they came to his house to put him to death. And the Japanese people have a lot of dignity. 
And they love and he loved Christ. And so it was an honor to die, and he knew that. So he said, Can I go put my best clothes on before you martyr me, before you cut my head off? And they said, Yes. So he comes down all dressed up. And he submitted like that, and they cut his head off. And his little five year old boy said, I too am a Catholic. You must cut my head off for Christ too. And they did. And they did. It's beautiful. We see in that beautiful movie, For the Glory of God, see the little young boy, how he did not waver, how he didn't get give in to human respect when they were ready to hang, they hung his friend in front of him. They said, you're next. All you have to do is, is deny Christ. And all he would cry out was, Viva Cristo Rey. Viva Cristo Rey. Long live Christ. And you know what happened to him. They ended up torturing him. They ended up cutting the soles of his feet off with, with machetes because he wouldn't give in to the world. Because he had the gift of faith, the gift of fortitude. Because this world is passing. The greatest gift we could get is if we lay down our life to the, for Christ. He knew that. He knew that Christ would give him new feet on the judgment day. He knew that if they cut his head off, God's going to put it back on. You're going to need this faith, my friend. Because if you deny Christ, you lose your soul. You're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. St. Alphonse tells a story about one man. He was a pious man too, but he wouldn't call on Christ to strengthen him while they were torturing him. And they would tell him, call on Jesus. And he thought he could do it himself. He apostatized. And the minute he apostatized and he denied Christ, he died. Not good. Not good. So yielding to human respect further betrays great weakness of judgment. For experience shows us that it is quite impossible to please everybody. Consider how different and how divergent are the judgments and appreciation of men. So that the proverb is always verified as many opinions as there, are, as there are minds. What pitiful weakness is it then to try and please the less virtuous, the less sensible and positively frivolous portions of the community? Any concession to human respect is moreover most injurious and pernicious to those who allow themselves to fall under its slavish influence. It renders all true peace of mind impossible, since on the one side it is attended with constant fear of the world and how it may regard us, and on the other with a constant remorse of conscience upbraiding us for our cowardice and hypocrisy. So when you're given the human respect, you're tortured. Because you know you're betraying Christ for a creature. You're tortured. You're tortured. You'll never have peace of mind. You have this fear of the world and fear of judgment. So you're tortured. Don't give in to it. Don't give in to it. Furthermore, it exposes our salvation to imminent peril. How many are lost through it? How great an amount of good is neglected or hindered by it? Human respect leads to most horrible sins. It leads to abortion. Leads to murder. Leads to blasphemy. Leads to violating every commandment there is. This nonsense today in the church, this political race makes me sick. Men saying they behold the sanctity of life. But it's all right, though, to kill babies in cases of rape, incest, and the health of a woman. But what does that mean? So if the woman has a cold, her health is in danger. The woman has more than sickness, her health is in danger. That's nonsense. How many Catholics... I tell them, get behind me, Satan. I don't want to hear that nonsense. These men are evil. Call them evil. Our Lord wants us to call them evil. We're a bunch of cowards. we got to wake up. We're all, you're giving in to human respect if you're taking these lines. Because even in the church, they're crying out, 
Oh no, the minute we speak up, that Father Isaac has said of a contest, he doesn't believe in the Pope. I'll die for the Pope. I may not agree with everything he says, I don't have to. I believe in everything that's been taught for 2,000 years, yes. And I respect his office. But right away, the minute you stand up for truth, they start attacking you. And then, he's not charitable. He tells me I'm a sinner, I'm going to go to hell. Well, that is true charity, to correct someone in their sins. It's not being merciful to tell somebody not correct someone. Because they're going to end up in hell. But so many people give in to human respect. I don't want to go through that. I see what happens to people, to laymen and priests that do stand up for the truth. The remnant in the church is getting lower and lower and lower. There are very few people that are faithful totally to Christ and His church. They don't even know it. They're so blind. I just saw this morning real quick, the new poll, 56% of Catholics believe that abortion should be allowed in almost all cases or most cases. 56%. Shame on them. You're going to burn in hell. Are you willing to tell them that? Don't fall for the lies. Because let me tell you something, my friends. If we're going to walk with Christ, we're going to suffer. If we're going to walk with Christ, we're going to be crucified. If we're going to walk with Christ, they're going to call us a drunk as they did him. If we're going to walk with Christ, they're going to tell us we're crazy like he was. And do you know what the saddest part is? What hurts the most is when it comes from those within the church. When it comes from the leadership of our church. One of the signs in the scripture of the end times is there will be apostasy in the church. That means from the top down. When you see appointments being made in the church, appointments in the church, in the highest appointments in the Vatican, where these cardinals, bishops, deny the perpetual virginity of Our Lady, the miracles of Jesus, the Eucharist, they believe in universal salvation, they believe in all kinds of crazy stuff that is condemned by the church. Are we supposed to remain silent? Are we supposed to remain silent? Or are we supposed to warn people and say, that's not what the church has taught and you will be crucified. But guess what? You're going to save your soul. And you're going to have a great glory in the church. One time the Arian heresy, almost oh, 90% of the church was in heresy. 90%! But the great saints cried out, It's heresy! They thought everybody said they were crazy. They weren't. They didn't give in to human respect. We can't give in to human respect. No matter how much we're going to suffer. No matter what they're going to do to us. Seeing the nation that he was exiled seven times. For being faithful to Christ in his church. Many a good sinner is thereby held in a captivity from which he would gladly escape. Many a one is the victim of a false and un unholy friendship. What kind of friendships do you have? Are you uh, keeping companions that like to do things like get drunk? Are you keeping company with other men that like to tell impure jokes? And you're embarrassed not you want to laugh because you don't want them to say, look at him, he's a holy roller. What are you doing? Examine all your friendships today. And let me tell you something. Anybody in your life that is not walking the way of Christ, you better cut them loose. Okay? Don't give in to that. Because you're responsible once again. We're responsible for every idle word we speak. Our Lord said, we're going to judge. We judge for every idle word. What about the words that are not idle? What about the words that are sinful? 
holy, unholy friendships lead more people to hell than we could even begin to imagine. Birds of a feather flock together. What kind of men are in your life? How many married men have unholy friendships with the opposite sex? You're not allowed to have particular friendships of the opposite sex when you're married, my friends. You're not allowed. Why? Because it's an occasion of sin and it's scandalous. It's scandalous. Okay, how many too are embracing false doctrines which they dare not reject through fear of what the world would say or the pain doing this world or the pain doing this would cause or the condemnation and contempt they would be exposed to. Once again, there are so many issues out there that are being denied today in the church. Very few Catholics and very few priests even truly know the faith. They don't. They don't know what the councils have taught. They don't know the dogmas of the church that we must all not only know but hold. And I, as I get it myself over the years, attacked so many times for preaching the truth. You know, one time I did a mission and, and uh, this person came to the pastor with 16 of my heresies. 16 of them. And the priest, I cracked up. So I said, okay, give me a list. Let's go. So I said, oh, number two, that's St. John Vianney's heresy, not Father Isaac's. Number four, five, that's St. Alphonse Liguori, another doctor of the church. Number seven, that's Council of Trent, on and on and on. Misquotes, total lies. You know why? Because the person was convicted of the truth. Because I, I hid something in their life, and this, and this person was supposed to be holy, walked on water, but I hit, hit a sore bone, you know, hit the spot where they were infected with sin, and they didn't want to give in to it. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to repent. So what do you do? You attack. This is out there, human respect. Human respect has brought others to a violent end by duels, by suicide, or it has held them enchained in mortal sin by the influence of bad company, of loose conversation, of going to bad movies, bad shows, and on and on and on. How many people you know, say, oh, let's go see a movie? And, 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 and they go to a movie, and then there's all kinds of bad stuff. They say, I'll just close my eyes. Uh, and they're closing their eyes like this. <laughs> they're looking too, you know. I'll close my eyes when the bad part comes. Yeah, I know this movie, they're going to blaspheme God 20 times, but I'll, I'll just go anyway. Today, there's no reason for it, because the Internet, there's some good websites, and we have to use them for the glory of God. We can go on the Internet and some good sites and find out how many curse words there are in every movie. If there's any nudity... Anything will tell you. Do they say the GD in there? And then you don't go. How many men give in to human respect for their wives when the wife wants to lead you into sin? And they do it all the time because things haven't changed. Eve led Adam into sin. And so the men are weak. And they use it as an excuse too. And they blame the wife just like Adam blamed the, his wife, Eve. Well, she did it. She, she tempted me. She led me in. You're the leaders. You have to correct your wife. Never let her lead you into sin. Never. Some men just give in, not only human respect, they just say it's easy to just give her what she wants. Let her shut up and leave me alone. You're not doing what you're called to do. Okay? The slave of human respect is guilty also of outrage against the majesty of God, who is the Lord of the universe and the law giver to mankind. God is all just, all wise, and all holy. Hence, his law is most just, most wise, and most holy. And our salvation depends upon our observance of it. Man is the work of his hands and depends on him for the use of his senses and for the preservation of all his bodily faculties and of every movement of his soul. 
Now this supreme ruler issues his commands and man, the worm of the earth, demurs perhaps and refuses to obey, his pretext being the necessity of thereby saving his honor. Are then the commandments of God dishonorable? Can he whose judgments are just and whose counsels are righteous enjoin anything which is mo not most noble, honorable, and praiseworthy? God commands, he dreadens with hell, he promises the eternal bliss of heaven, and yet the victim of human respect does not heed at all, because one will say this, another may do that, or a third person is seen to be pained and offended and will bitterly reproach him. This is so true. So that you, they don't keep, you don't keep your end before you. It says in the Bible, if you keep your end before you, you will not sin. You will not sin. So many people just worried about what people will think about them. You know, I have so many women come up to me sometimes. They say, Father, should I wear a veil in church? I said, what do you think? Didn't you ever read the Bible? The Holy Spirit is a word. It's the word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It tells the women to cover her head. And they admit it to me. They say, the reason I don't, I'm embarrassed. I'm shameful because they mock me. Well, it's a blessing to be mocked for Christ. It's a blessing. What about you? I see the way people come to church now. It's a disgrace. The way they dress. The way men dress, too. You know, in the gym clothes. Man, years ago, every, they used to wear suits and ties because they were coming into the temple of God. Are you embarrassed to do that? You don't want people talking about you? Thus is formed the deliberate preference of the favor of men to that of God. And the crime of the Jewish rabble is repeated and intensified in their cry. Not this man, but Barabbas. Release to us Barabbas and let Jesus be crucified. Keep this image before you when you're put in a situation where you know you're being led into sin because you're embarrassed to say no. Picture yourself that you're choosing Barabbas over Christ. You're saying, no, let that murderer go and crucify the innocent one. That's what you do. That's what you do. Every time someone at work blasphemes God, His church, the Blessed Virgin, or the angels, the saints, and you remain silent, you are choosing Barabbas. And you're saying, crucify Jesus. And it's getting tough because they're going to fire you from your jobs for defending Christ. Our faith is going to about to be outlawed in this country. You know what, though? They laugh about the Catholic Church now, the government too. Uh, the wicked administration we have is literally from hell. And the lesser the two evil that they say is less than two evil, he's from hell too. They're all from hell. They're going to crucify us. They're going to want you to deny Christ. That's what all communists do. Look what they did. Read about what happened in China. Read about what happened in Russia. Read about what happened in Germany. Communism, there's no place for God. No place for God. And there's definitely no place for Catholics. They're not too worried about the church in this country because they know it's made up of lukewarm people. They know it's made up of a bunch of men that are emasculated and that are not willing to fight for Christ in His church. They know it's made up of men that will not lead their families. They know it's made up of shepherds that instead of feeding the flock are devouring the flock. They know it's made up of shepherds that instead of gathering the flock, they're scattering the flock. They laugh at us. They laugh at Christ. They laugh at His church. Human respect.
So the slave of human respect, once again, is guilty also of outrage against the majesty of God, who is the Lord of the universe and the lawgiver of mankind. Let me, I'm trying to find my spot. Here we go. The obligation, then, of confessing God before men is likewise ignored, and the threatening consequences of being rejected by him deliberately incurred. Besides all this, the slave of human respect is in the language of holy writ, declared to be an idolater, inasmuch as he puts the creature in place of the creator, and puts to him that homage and reverence which are due to God alone. And I see this all the time. One, you know, examples popping up in my head that's so important that is constantly being denied in the church today. He's going to, for instance, these weddings that are not blessed by God. That if you have a son or a daughter who was married in the Catholic Church, say, and they get divorced and there's no annulment and they remarry, they say, Father, can I go to that wedding? Wait, are you on drugs? You're not allowed to go to those weddings. If you have a friend who's a Roman Catholic and marries outside the church, you're not allowed to go to that wedding. You must follow the precepts of the church when it comes to marriage. I see so many parents, they come to me and they don't want to hear it. So they go to 20 other priests and unfortunately... Usually all 20 will tell them, no, you got to keep communication open. If you don't go to the wedding, you're going to cut your children off, and that's wrong. And I say, you fool, you're worried about communication with your, with your son, your daughter, and you've just cut off all communication with God because you committed a mortal sin, and you're cooperating with their sin, and you are committing scandal. And your son now is an adulterer, adulterous relationship, or a fornicator. I don't get it. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be a theologian to know that this is wrong. And so once again, you're betraying God. You're putting respect over, for the creature over God. You're ignoring God's laws, God's rules, so that you can please your son or your daughter. It's disgraceful. These people all have double standards. They're telling you, because they said, but my daughter don't understand. They'll never talk to me. Yeah, your daughter's saying to you, you don't do this. I'm cutting you out of my life. You must respect my ways, ma, dad. Well, how come they don't respect yours? So it's a double standard. They don't respect your beliefs, but you have to respect their erroneous beliefs. And then I tell these people, I explain it to them. And, 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 they, and then they, the next question comes. All right, Father, I won't go to the ceremony, but can I go to the reception? I said, oh, I just want to bang my head on the wall. I said, God, take me out of this world. I can't take this no more. I said, you know what that's like? That's like saying your son comes up to you and says, Dad, I got my 1911. I got some nice hollow points in it too. I'm going to blow Tommy's brains out. Can you come with me? Let's, I want you to watch it. And you say, oh, son, I don't know. I don't want to watch it. But when you're done, we'll go to the pub and I'll buy you a Guinness, you know, and we'll celebrate. Oh, so absurd. So stupid. Because you're giving in to human respect. Let me tell you something, if you don't go to that wedding, eventually your son or daughter will be converted. Because when people don't give in, even if it's just one person in the family, I've seen it because I know it happens all the time. I had one man I, I, I helped with this, his brother-in-law was getting married outside, I said, no, you can't go, I don't want to hear it, that's it. So he, he slept on the couch for six months, he had a bad back, <laughs> but uh, guess what, his wife ended up having a big conversion. So he had to do penance. God brings good out of evil. But that's what happens. We cannot give in to these sins. I'm just giving you some of the ones that are most common today. That's human respect. So I'm going to honor my daughter, my son, even. And they say, but I told my son, I told my daughter that I don't agree with it. But I'll support them. I said, oh man, unbelievable. 
I tell him all the time. I said, so if your son, uh, you know, tells you, come on, you know, I want, I'm going to, I'm going to be shooting up some heroin today. Come, you know, will you support me in that, mom, dad? Of course not. Well, why are you supporting him? My Lord said, don't worry about those that can harm the body, but who can only cast thy soul into Gehenna. You know, we got to wake up. We got to wake up. If you've done some of these sins, you better confess them today. So it is absolutely necessary for us now to choose between bearing the scouts of a few men for a brief time here on earth and the malignant gives in sarcasm of the multitude host of devils and of the lost souls and fires of hell for all eternity. And we must quit the broad road of fashion and of worldliness or else reign resign all hope of entering that narrow gate which opens up into the boundless realms of never-ending bliss. If we now at once overcome the shameful weakness, we shall escape the wretched company of those who will one day be forced to acknowledge these are they whom we held in derision and whose lives we esteemed as a disgrace. We fools esteem their lives as madness and their end without honor, and lo, they are numbered among the saints. I beg, I beg God that that's all of us one day, that that will be us, that we will be numbered among the saints, but we will be mocked and ridiculed in this world. My friends, the only way you're going to endure this, the only way you could fight human respect, the only way you're going to overcome this weakness and not give in to the world. You got to be a man of prayer. You got to be meditating every day. And you got to beg God for those graces. This is one of the biggest problems in all your life, especially dealing with your children. Are you letting your daughters dress like prostitutes immodestly? So many men give in to that. I said, well, How can you let your daughter walk out of the house like that or even in the house? I don't want to hear my wife. You know, all the kids are doing it. Yeah, they're all going to hell too. Human respect. I don't want my daughter to be mad at me. How come you're not disciplining your child? Well, I don't want to be too strong. Uh, you know, uh, I'll alienate them. And then, huh. no, no way. No way. Let us feel convinced. That every time we yield to this weakness, we rivet a flesh link to our chains and seal more effectually our degradation, denigration beneath a miserable and ignoble tyranny. And we submit to a slavery most unworthy of that nobility of soul in which God has endowed us. Why indeed should we consent to waste our lives at the bidding of another? Not only without any gain, but at so irreparable a loss. And besides, who are they that are able to thus make us slaves of human respect? They are the vilest, the most ignoble amongst men, whose marks of contempt should rather be our praise and glory, and whose praise and esteem would be a reproach and shame to us. Men whose dreads are empty talk, and whose power to harm us rest only on the weakness with which men yield to them. Fear not them who can only kill the body, but cannot hurt the soul. What then is the remedy for this weakness? It is that we should, from the first, modestly, we must, we should, from the first, modestly assess our independence, though always with uncompromising firmness, especially in the case of forming new acquaintances. Be careful of your friendships, and especially any new ones. Is this man going to lead me closer to God, and am I going to lead him closer? That's the definition of friendship that St. Teresa of Avila gave us, the great doctor of the church. A true friendship means each person leads each other to Christ. If it's only happening on one end, it's not a friendship. Be careful, my friends. Don't let your pride get away and think that you're going to convert someone. I've seen many a men go down, especially with the opposite sex. They say, well, you know, I'm going to be a, I'm a friend. You know, I'm going to bring her to Christ. Yeah, she brings you to Satan eventually. 
Be careful. Be very, very careful. We should regulate our lives and views according to the principle of holy faith. We must live in the practical consciousness of our own dignity and of the duties and obligation which it involves. You've got to know your vocation. How many of you men here that are married have studied what marriage is? How many of you men read Kosti Kanubi? Probably saying, what the heck is that? These are the writings of the great popes on marriage. Have you gone over the great catechism of Trent and said, what, what does the Council of Trent say about marriage? There's a great website I recommend. It's called the Master Catechism. It's an awesome website. And what the Master Catechism website has, it has the catechism broken down into regular categories, say the sacraments, the creed, the sacraments. And what it does is say, say the sacrament of matrimony. And then it has a little bar there. It says Thomas Aquinas, his catechism, the great holy doctor. The next is the Council of Trent's catechism. The next is St. Pius X's catechism, which was based on the catechism of Trent. The next is the Baltimore catechism. And the last is the new catechism. What's awesome about that is you click on each one on marriage. And, and, and you're going to learn so much. How can you men live out your vocation if you don't even know what it is? How many men don't even know what the end of marriage is? It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Another website I want to give you, I highly, highly recommend, is Father John Harden Archives. Father John Harden was a great, great Jesuit who I believe was a saint. His cause is up for canonization. Father John Harden used to give the spiritual exercise. He was a real Jesuit, a holy Jesuit. And then on his website, they have some of his papers. But the last I checked, they keep adding, there was 2,400 talks. 2,400 of his talks for free. Usually that gets people free. What do you mean? <laughs> it's free. So don't waste your time with all these gurus out there uh, with their tapes. Don't even waste your time listening to my stuff. Listen to Father Harden. He was a great theologian. He was a holy man. And he has uh, spiritual exercises for retreats that he gave to men, that he gave to women. And so, you know, you, hopefully most of you come at least once a year to a retreat like this. But you could even start doing once a month, make a commitment. Say, so, you know, I'm going to spend two hours this, every Saturday once a month, three hours or the whole afternoon, and I'm going to listen to some of Father Harden's talk, say. And you could go on there and click, and maybe you're struggling with a particular vice or something that's going to click family life, and you go down the list and say, whoa, this is what I need to hear. So you could go, listen to the talk, go into the church, pray, strengthen yourself. This is what you need. So the spirit of faith must be kept alive by great fidelity to our spiritual duties and by a frequent reception of the holy sacraments of the church. We must also reject with energy the first suggestions of human respect and the first questions, questionings of what the world will say. What the world will say. So that's the main thing. Prayer. The sacraments. Try to make it a habit to go to Mass daily. I don't know how people can stay away from the Eucharist if you really believe that that is Jesus Christ's body, soul, and divinity. You will do everything in your power to go to daily Mass. And some of you can't. So then learn how to do spiritual communions. Take advantage of the confessional. I recommend nothing less than once a week Never go less than every two weeks because if you don't, you can't get your indulgences. You have to go eight days before or eight days after to get an indulgence. Pray the family rosary. The rosary is not an option today, my friends. It's mandatory. And it's true the rosary that Our Lady, Our Lord, conquers heresies. It's true the rosary that puts the end to wars and famines. And this is what we're going to need again, the rosary. We have a rosary rally. We've been doing it for a few months now down at the state capitol on Thursday. You know what? 
those good people that come and it's always the same people, average 200, say, where's the rest of the diocese? And I hear some of the pitiful excuses that I hear through the grapevine when some people don't come. Well, I don't like to drive at night. Well, the rosary, most of it, that since we've been down there, it didn't get dark till 8 or 9 o'clock at night, you know? And uh, all these nonsense reasons, but they'll, they'll go to a party, they'll go to a wedding, they'll do all these other things. We don't got our priorities right. Many people are afraid to go down the public forum and pray the rosary. Because when we go down there, there's hecklers, there's people mocking us. What a great gift it is. What a great grace it is to be mocked for Jesus Christ. To have people laughing at us, say, look at those fools saying the same words over and over and over again. But praise God, it's through those words that the head of Satan is crushed. Pray to the Blessed Virgin today for the grace never, never, never to give in to him respect. It's one of my daily prayers. And I'd, I'd rather die than give in to it. You have to have that attitude. So... We will have confessions now in the room.